I'm 15. I'd like to begin with thanking you for once again giving your time and attention to the Sunday Forum and the Lent program we redeemed. This is the second of the four forums. And I am also grateful for the trust that you are offering me in leading you through a process that I hope will eventuate in some opening of grace in our individual lives and our parish life. For me, this is one of the more profound journeys that I've been on personally, being here at St. Matthew's, and a more profound journey being here with you all. So I'm grateful that you would come online. Hello, I can see you directly from my laptop. It's great to have you here, and it's of course great to be in person. Wednesday night, we had the first discussion of the Lent program, and there was so much energy in that evening, so much desire to get this right, to get our history right, and to do the right thing. Um, there was, and there was different views on what that right thing might be. So there was a lot of this energy around slavery, around our history, and behind that, a lot of anguish and a lot of desire to correct the wrongs of the past. And all of this shows that there was and is a heart of compassion in this community and a desire to ease the pain that we feel in our relationship with ourselves and our history and with our community. And all that's a sign of grace and a sign of goodness. But I want to start today by managing expectations, all right? Manage expectations about this program. This is a merely a four-week Lenten program. It's going to go for four weeks. It is what I judge to be the needful step right now on our journey as a parish. So it's just four weeks, but I believe it's the next needful step for us. It's not meant to be a solution to the anguish involved in parts of our history. There's also a lot of glory in our history as well. But it's not meant to be a solution for the anguish that's there. It's not meant to be a lecture series which is going to open to you to the, the fullness of St. Matthew's history. That's not what we're doing. Its aim is much more limited, much more focused, and I hope much more deep. It is to use our history, just a couple examples from it, to help us to learn about ourselves, our own human condition, our own human frailty of the people in this room and on Zoom. It's not of what happened 100 years ago, it's about it's about us now, and we're using our history to open this up for us. And it's also meant to show us how vulnerable the gospel can be to misuse under the forces of, of social and economic pressures of any age. And how we might be inclined to misuse the gospel to reinforce our own purposes. Following from that, when we see how the gospel was incredibly narrow to be able to live alongside the practice of slavery, and how we still live under the shadow of that narrowing today, the corollary of that is that we'll be able to begin to glimpse the broader, the wider, the deeper gospel that is not quite so otherworldly, a much more human, a much more concrete, a much more this worldly gospel about how we live with our neighbors. So this program is about growing in humility about ourselves. It's about growing in humility about our tendency to misuse or misappropriate or narrow the gospel to fit our own purposes and needs and therefore to glimpse the possibility of 
a fuller gospel about how we are in this world with our neighbors. And I wonder if this will lead to, my hope is that it might lead to St. Matthew's being a little bit more intense, you might say, about guarding the wholeness of the human soul and a little more intense about allowing the gospel to challenge our particular viewpoints and a little more intense about caring for the gospel as a whole. So, I'm wishing for a delicate emergence in the community of humility about ourselves and more a delicate emergence of an honoring of one another, a delicate emergence of a love for this gospel which speaks to us as an alien voice calling us always into something new. But that kind of delicate emergence doesn't just happen when you think something. We need to put ourselves in a position of stillness and quietness and listening to let things really speak to us, like we do with great art, like we do with the liturgy, like we do um, in any kind of deep relationship, where we're there really to hear and let this speak to us about ourselves, about our lives, about our journey. And my role in this, um, as I've thought about this in the past week, um, is that I am temperamentally inclined, you might say obsessive, about taking small bits of experience and like reading them like a poem and letting them come down and really speak to me and invite me to change or to show a new way of life. That's kind of part of the DNA of me. That's what I do. And so I'm offering this to this parish at this time. And as I said, it's my pastoral sense of us, of St. Matthew's at this time, that this journey into a listening and a humility and a wondering about just what the gospel is, is the right next step. It's not the whole journey. It's not going to solve things. It's not going to fix things. But it begins to get us in the way of being able to enter more deeply into relationship with ourselves and our God and our neighbor. So why don't we begin, after that rather extended prologue, <laughs> with a prayer. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. God, we are grateful to be here in this parish. We are grateful to be here with each other. We are grateful to have our history to show us both the greatness and the failures involved in being human. We ask you to bless us on this parish journey, that we may grow in our self-knowledge, grow in more tenderness to each other, grow in a greater tenderness to the gospel of Jesus Christ and his leading of us. And I ask this in his name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So, unlike last week, we're actually going to get into hearing some of more difficult stories. And I want to remind you of three ways we try to distance ourselves from difficult stories. We can condemn those who appear to be bad in the stories. Well, they were very, very bad. And then we feel we're very distant from them. We have no part in them. Therefore, we feel good and whole in ourselves. It's kind of a righteousness through condemning others. It feels good, and it protects us. <laughs> well, it does. It feels good, and it protects us. <clears throat> but it also doesn't allow change. And it also splits us off from one another. We can also distort reality, what I call the sweet tea approach in Southern history, that by putting a whole lot of sugar into the tea and a whole lot of lemon and some cream, you can drink anything with enough sugar and lemon in it. Chard is lovely with enough bacon. <laughs> it's that kind of thing. That's kind of that 
amendation, and then we can deny, deny the relevance of any of this to us, which is pretty common too. That was then, this is now, it's totally different, but guess what? We are still human, and the gospel is still the gospel, and that's what we're focused on in this talk. Now, a couple of people have pointed out to me that I am not a southerner. <laughs> and that and and that's funny, right? But but there's a seriousness to that though, which is that I don't know from my lived experience what it is to be like grow up in the south. I don't, right? But I do know about sweet tea. I know about sweet tea history. My grandfather, as some of you know, was drafted into the German army in World War II, was a guard in a concentration camp, and then was sent to fight in the Eastern Front, captured by the Russians, and so forth. And where my family history gets distorted is just how much violence was needed to coerce Josef, my grandfather, to join the German army. In some stories that I hear, the whole family was lined up with the, with the German soldiers, and they would shoot all of them if Grandpa didn't join. And in some of their stories, they just came to the door and he joined. There's a kind of a, 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 a distortion of history there to try to see how do we live with this history ourselves as a family. We're not blaming, we're not seeking righteousness, but we're seeking to let these stories help us to grow us in self-awareness. And today, I'm just going to begin, and this is strategic for a couple of reasons, by reminding us all again of the story of Thomas Ruffin. Some of you have heard this endlessly. Some of you don't know who Thomas Ruffin is, and that's part of my strategy, to get the whole parish on board around this century of history of this one person. He was born in 1787 in Virginia. His grave is one of the, had the oldest birth year, or one of the oldest birth years in our churchyard. He studied law in North Carolina, was a, had a law practice, and was a farmer here in Hillsboro. He was on the North Carolina Superior Court from 1829 to 1852 and 1858 to 1859. So many years, many decades, with a chief justice for about 20 of those years. And he worked with another parishioner, Duncan Cameron, uh, on the State Bank of North Carolina. And by any estimation, he was an accomplished jurist. One person wrote, the election of former Superior Court judge and State Bank President Ruffin to the bench in 1829 effectively ensured the North Carolina Supreme Court's survival. That's Martin Brinkley and as is ranked by Harvard Law School Dean Roscoe Pound as one of the 10 greatest jurists in American history. Right, so he had a very keen legal mind and we are going to end today being grateful for that keen mind of Ruffin in one very, very critical aspect, so just hang on. His writings on eminent domain transformed North Carolina from being the Rip Van Winkle state to being a state fully open to the industrial uh, revolution. And if you want, if you're a newcomer to Hillsborough, you can go up on, on uh, Churton Street and you can see his house up there at the now the town the town hall, up at the corner of something in Churton, right up there. <laughs> <laughs> up there. <laughs> so maybe I'm getting more southern, you know? <laughs> yonder. 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 Yeah, it's by the tree up there. <laughs> <laughs> So from Cronenberg's, we have a, a parishioner, uh, Alan Cronenberg is a parishioner, and he wrote this history of, from the abundance of God's grace for St. Matthew, of our history, and I have copies of this to give out. The importance of Ruffin to us is that he was instrumental in the formation of St. Matthew's Church in the 1810s and 1820s. Remember the Church of England Church? basically fell apart after the Revolutionary War and they remade it in the 1820s. He gave the land on which our church is built and for much of the churchyard. And he was a close associate, as I said, of Duncan Cameron, father-in-law to Duncan's son, Paul. And the Ruffin families are entwined throughout the history of Hillsborough and of this parish. 
so that there are, are still one or two parishioners related to him, and one more immediately was Isabel Webb, who many of you knew. Now, the recent history of this is that in 2000, we built this amazing parish house up the hill, and the parish named the house after him, the Ruffin House. Shortly after they did that, Brooks Graveyard, the rector then, and Sally Green learned more about Ruffin to indicate that he was, one, a particularly harsh or cruel owner of slaves. He made some incredibly painful and extensive rulings on the Supreme Court about the rights of slave owners over the slaves. And he secretly engaged in illicit slave trade in order to make money to shore up his finances, a trade that at that time was shunned by his other white slave-owning colleagues. So this led to a very long discussion. We had a lot of cottage groups, and we eventually decided, after a lot of work, to rename the Ruffin House the Parish House. And that whole process has left us with standing business. Do we want a memorial to enslaved persons? We think we do on the parish property. Do we, uh, how do we reach out to some of the descendants of, of slaves in Orange County and the underserved as a whole? How might we contextualize our con Confederate War memorials, our Confederate memorials? And for newcomers here, I'm just catching you up on, just, this is just a, a little window into where the parish has been in this discussion and a little window into our history. And again, I wonder how you're doing with all of this. Like, the intent here is not to judge Ruffin or to blame him or to forgive him, but it's to let some of the reality that he was involved in speak to us about ourselves. I'm going to stop for a moment and check in with you all. Are there questions or concerns or thoughts? I know, like, Thomas Ruffin in this parish is now like a, he's just like a can of gasoline, you know? <laughs> and if anybody's smoking in the room, it kind of ignites. That's why I've tried to frame it very carefully. Um, but are there any, any, anything that you would like to say to the group at this point, either online, I'm going to make sure my chat is up, or in person? All right. Pear. Having thought and been around discussions and actually being from the South, and I don't really know that that matters at this point, this feels to me like a discussion that requires a certain amount of um, openness that is um, to something other than I've been taught, something other than um, the general understanding of, of enslaved people um, and the history of this area is something that's been very important to me and uh, it's hard. I'll just say it. Okay, so for those people online or if you didn't catch that, what Pear has been saying is though she's from the South um, and we have this discussion and we begin to sort of wonder about different ways of understanding the past or hearing the past or hearing different voices from the past, that can be really hard and painful to do. And so we recognize there could be some difficulty in that. And that's when you feel that sense of like, this is painful, that's when you say, I'm out of here. I'm going to condemn Ruffin and feel better. No. Right? No. Or I'm going to uh, just say, well, it wasn't that bad. Or I'm going to say, well, it's not really relevant to me at all. How about more? So we're just more. more. So we're going to be with this, and I'll tell you that this, this, I've been working with this myself for two and a half years, and it is painful. It's simply as painful for me every time I go into it. So let's let's sort of just commit each other to staying with each other in this community as we go through this. I'm going to tell the story. Oh, somebody's online. Hey, it's Charles. Hello. Uh, I have one or two thoughts. Can you hear me okay? We can hear you. I wanted your thoughts, but I didn't want to get ahead of what you were going to say. It's reactions to your invitation to us to think about Thomas Ruffin in a humanistic way and not try to distance ourselves too much, but still be clear eyed. Um, is this the right time, or would you like me to come in a little bit later after you go a little bit further? Uh, why don't you come in? 
What's on your mind? Yeah, just the, the, the things. The first thing is that um, I actually, I'm sorry, not, not to correct me. He actually was educated in Princeton. And one of the letters that he writes his father when he was in Princeton is that his roommate is also a slave, uh, from a slave holding family in Virginia. And he writes his father, you know, my roommate is going into law because he really doesn't like this whole slave owning thing. And I kind of have some misgivings about it as well. And his father basically says, man, up. that's just the way the world works. So in an early stage, you do see a humanities as a, kind of a questioning about the institution it's born into. So that's my first thought. My second thought is, is, is that he can be forgiven for not creating the slave system that he excelled in, and he obviously excelled in it in, in doing that. So you know, he, was, he made himself successful in the, in the institution that existed. Where I think he can't be forgiven is that once he um, achieves a level of power within that system, that he actually doesn't use his power to improve it. And those are my three observations, Robert. Sorry if I get ahead of anything you wanted to say. No, that's great. And we're not even going to talk a whole lot more about Ruffin, actually. <laughs> we're, we're looking at him, an instance from his life in a moment. But uh, Charles, that's Charles Planbeck, and he brought up the interesting point that, um, that in his younger years, this is classic. This is just classic. He has misgivings. He has, the soul is intact, right? That's what we're going to talk about it. There's compassion, a sense maybe this isn't right. And the response of the forces around him are man up. In other words, what does man up mean? Man up means don't listen to your heart. You've got a duty. Cut off, disconnect, kill that part of you so you can fulfill your duty in the world around you. And then about, and then Charles's point, he did, he did not, once he had power, he, he sort of extended, I don't, I'm going to get more into this motion of what, what he extended in, right now. I don't think he extended so much in his ruling of state versus man. I think he clarified. And whether we like that clarity or not is another question. So this is Sally Green from 2019. Many of you have heard this. Some of you haven't. We're talking about this ruling of state versus man. He was on the Supreme Court. This is what Sally said. A certain John Mann, a poor white, a widower, an old sea captain, certainly cannot afford to own a slave. But even poor white men want a mastery over blacks. The research shows that poor whites regularly employ black workers when they could not have found white ones. And so in 1828 and 1829, he engaged for hire a domestic slave named Lydia. One day, uh, Sunday, March 1st, 1829, while man was, quote, correcting Lydia, the opinion says, for some minor offense, that's in quotes, she bolted. He got out his gun and shot her from behind. Man was charged with assault and battery. Remember, Lydia was not his own slave. A jury of 12 slave-owning men found him guilty. Mann appealed his conviction to the NC Supreme Court, and reversing the lower court, Judge Ruffin wrote a doozy of an opinion. No matter that Mr. Mann had hired the slave and was not the true owner, he wrote, he had to be given the full power of the master, and short of acting with intent to kill, that power was without qualification. Quote, the power of the master must be absolute to render the submission of the slave perfect. In justifying this result, Ruffin described the workings of, the slaver, of slavery in chillingly flank, frank terms. No slave works out of a sense of natural duty, he wrote, or for the sake of his own personal happiness. Such services can only be expected from one who has no will of his own. Such obedience is a consequence only of uncontrolled authority over the body. Unfettered power in the hands of the master, even a temporary master, was necessary because the foundation of slavery was, in fact, brute force. Now, I'm quoting that as often something to sort of talk about as a way of like, whoa, gosh, that was, you know, horrible of Ruffin to write that. But was it? Because what he was doing was actually just clarifying the logic of slavery that existed all around him. Uh, Chris. I think, it, I think it's interesting because I think so often we think about um, what's legal and what's moral. And it, there's a dichotomy by that, and I think it exists today. So 
as, as you say, he was clarifying a system that was legal, but I would argue highly immoral. So, so the system was immoral, but it was highly legal. And so what, what do we do in those situations as human beings? Uh, it's legal, but immoral. What? Yes. So we, we try to soften it. We blur the logic around it. And what Ruffin did was to clarify the actual logic of the legal system. That slavery was, in fact, a violent power used to enforce other human beings to continue existing and working in debasing and horrible situations which they did not desire. That's simply the fact. Right? That's what we were just saying. This is what's actually involved. And without total authority over the body, this could not continue. Violence, physical violence, is required for coercion. And here we're at that, at that, at that man up point, right? That uh, Charles brought forward. Because the corollary is that if you want to be relating to human beings in this way, you have to kill off part of yourself. You have to kill off part of your soul to live this way with other human beings. You have to find perhaps a justification why you can be this way with other humans, to have no fellow feeling for them. And I, I have a, just a Robert intuition about the kind of self-hatred that would grew underneath that, and the kind of the hatred for the system, and then the hatred of the slave in themselves. Because all of this is forced rough. And remember he was thinking like, you know, I'm not sure this is right, forced him into the situation. Hatred, I think, would come out of this. And then finally, we ponder, okay, this was done by self-identified Christians who are commanded, the new commandment of Jesus, the mandate, is to love one another. And from Genesis, that each human being is walking around bearing the image of God. So there's, there's this horrible splitting of human beings. Partly this way, perhaps having compassion over here, and then partly having to exercise, <coughs> choosing, having, who knows where that is, a drastic cruelty in which they have to cut off from all sense of compassion, all sense of feeling. And this is part of where we get to in our own lives. I'm going to make a jump here. This is a very strange jump to Martin Heidegger, 20th century philosopher. Mm -hmm. Heidegger said something, I think, really instructive. He said that you don't really know what a hammer is. You don't really notice a hammer and see, know it as its limits and what it is until it breaks. When it's just a hammer, it's just an extension of your will and your intention, right? And so you don't really notice it until it breaks. Now, when slaves are docile and they're just being extensions of your will, you don't even notice that their dignity is being debased, perhaps. There can be a lot of sense of, 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 of perhaps of relationship. But when their docility breaks and they claim their dignity, I will not stand for this. I will not be a slave like this. I will not be treated like this. Suddenly, their humanness is revealed. That's when the hammer is seen, the person is seen, the human being is glimpsed, and that is met with overwhelming force and violence. Because that cannot be seen. If they are seen as human, it all breaks down. It's a very, very, very delicate moment. And I was thinking further about this, that, uh, why, again, slaves are like cattle, right? <laughs> and they're treated as possessions and like cattle, but unlike cattle, they're dangerous possessions. Because at any moment, they might show their humanity, their oneness with you, their claim on you. They might rise up and revolt against you, hence more violence is required to keep that from occurring. 
Hmm. So we're in this really difficult place where we just say that we as human beings are born into systems, cultural phenomena, economic systems, political systems, social systems, that sometimes demand that we stop <coughs> feeling for another. We cannot do that. And we find ways of justifying it. And it creates a soul sickness in us and a hatred in us. Even as we, even as we say yes to the system which is shaping us, we hate ourselves and the system because we don't like what it's doing to us, but we can't stop it. And that's all times and places. Once we cut off that compassion, once we cut off and we say it's righteous not to feel for any reason, and we'll get more into the reasons for this next week, how it was justified, then all kinds of things can go on. Then you've let the devil out. Then you are like free to let evil run. There's a man, Will, who was barbecued and salted and peppered on Ruffin's estate. That was a very common practice. There is a story of Mary Walker, who was a slave with the Camerons, who ran away in Philadelphia, desperately desired to get her children, to buy her children back out of slavery, and the Camerons said no. This, those, your children are too helpful for us in running the house. And then there is the whole idea of the slave trade and this remarkably difficult uh, phenomena of selling human beings, breaking up families to make money and to make the most possible money as you do so. Some of you may have brought your photograph from last week. <clears throat> I'm putting something up on the screen. Some of you may have brought the photograph. That's Thomas Ruffin up in the upper left. And that's a, a group of slaves as they were freed in Virginia in the, at the end of the Civil War. And I asked you to have some kind of human connection with them last week to listen to them. Does anybody need one of these? So, I don't, I don't know how, how far to take this, so I'm going to offer sort of a middle story about the slave auction. Not the easy ones, not the really hard ones, a middle one. This is from Josiah Henson, Truth Stranger Than Fiction, Father Henson's Story of His Own Life, 1858. He writes, uh, the slave anticipates the time when he'll be put up on the block. And still the full misery of the event, of the scenes which precede and succeed it, is never understood till the actual experience comes. And I should say that Josiah Henson was enslaved in Maryland, and this is a story, this is autobiographical. This is him writing. The first sad announcement that the sale is to be, the knowledge that all ties of the past are to be sundered, the frantic terror at the idea of being sent down south, the almost certainty that one member of a family will be torn from another, the anxious scanning of purchasers' faces, the agony at parting often forever with husband, wife, child, these must be seen and felt to be fully understood. Young as I was then, the iron entered into my soul. The remembrance of the breaking up of McPherson's estate is photographed in its minutest features in my mind. The crowd collected around the stand, the huddling group of Negroes, the examination of muscle and teeth, the exhibition of agility, the look of the auctioner, the agony of my mother, I can shut my eyes and see them all. 
My brothers and sisters were bit off first and one by one, while my mother, paralyzed by grief, held me by the hand. Her turn came, and she was bought by Isaac Riley of Montgomery County. Then I was offered to the assembled purchasers. My mother, half distracted with the thought of parting forever from all her children, pushed through the crowd while she was bidding for me, while the bidding for me was going on, to the spot where Riley was standing. She fell at his feet and clung to his knees, entreating him in tones that a mother only could command to buy her baby as well as herself, and to spare her one at least of her little ones. Will it, can it be believed that this man thus appealed to was capable not merely of turning a deaf ear to her supplication to buy one of her children, but of disengaging himself from her with such violent blows and kicks as to reduce her to the necessity of creeping out of his reach and mingling the groan of bodily suffering with the sob of a breaking heart. As she crawled away from the brutal man, I heard her sob out, O oh Lord Jesus, O oh Lord Jesus, how long? How long shall I suffer this way? I must have been between five and six years old. I seem to see and hear my poor white mother weeping now. That's the autobiography of Josiah Henson. You, and it's tough. Hey, you, you call that the middle, the middle uh, observation? There's others in here that are very much more difficult. And we don't, there's aspects of the slave trade that are much worse. So this is really difficult material. And I want to pause. And I'd like to give us time to reflect with this. What I'm looking for is just whatever you're feeling or thinking at this moment, and I'm going to invite you, like last week, not to tell the group, but to tell God in your journal. Some of you brought your journals from last time. If you need a journal or something to write on and something to write with, Maybe someone could help me hand these out. Would you hand out the pencils and ran? Sorry to call you the journals. I also have some blank paper. You just need blank paper. Pencils are coming around. We're going to take around 10 minutes to write on our experience of that story with this picture. And at home, I actually uh, encourage you to get some paper out and a pen, and just to look at that photo on your screen, just to write about, tell God about what you're feeling, thinking, wondering. Just write freely, there's no need for erasure. You're not going to share this with anybody. Um, I need a pencil, a couple pencil over here. No erasures. Just write freely, whatever comes to mind. This is an introverted, reflective process, you might say. Just write. Right.
just a couple more minutes, one or two minutes. We could wrap our reflection up. Just a few more, a few more seconds. This is uh, this is very difficult material. This is part of where we've been as human beings in this life. Part of our Lent is about self-reflection and facing into some difficult things, so that we can grow so that we can open this to God's light and God's love. I want to recall you all to the fact that there is a God who has arms big enough to hold all of this and to hold you in the middle of it and to hold us as a community. In my own reflection with this and more my praying with these realities, the first thing that became clear was how Christ crucified and the humanity of Jesus on the cross and the humanity of the slave became aligned. And that's central in my imagination in the celebration of Eucharist together. And Mary Walker in that book, To Free a Family, talks about the slaves sneaking out at night, facing great punishment if they were caught, to sneak out, giving up their sleep, sneaking out at night to go worship the God of Jesus Christ. Out in the fields, out in the forests. They had a relationship with this God and they knew this God would eventually free and God was a holder of their dignity. But they were creeping out at night to worship in the way they knew in the fields and in the forests. And I have a sense too, and I don't want to jump too quickly to any kind of closure, but I have just in my praying a sense of the glorified Christ holding these people and healing them, healing them. We believe that our God heals, <clears throat> can heal anything, can heal any suffering. And it's like the bosom of Abraham image. They are present in him as I celebrate and we celebrate Eucharist together in this place. He's holding them at our altar. It's extraordinary. And then what about, what about the enslavers? And there was a lot of discussion on Wednesday about do we forgive, does God forgive? I think, like, eventually, we all have to have to ask forgiveness of one another, of those whom we've wronged, to be allowed into the heavenly community. And so these slaves have a kind of a place where the enslavers had to ask their forgiveness. And can they be healed enough to offer that forgiveness? It's all the mysteries of the kingdom. I'm trying to draw this into a much bigger context than how we as human beings are in the moment. There is a God around this. God has this and is working with us and we are part of this. And the kingdom of God, as we know from the Magnificat and the Beatitudes and Jesus' life and everything else, is a place where the first are last and last are first we can expect some interesting reverses. So, for the coming week, 
we have the Wednesday night discussion where I really invite you to bring uh, not so much your solutions to the whole history of racial violence in America or your interpretation about how to get it right, but to bring how you are doing with this process that we have started today, really, and any reflections you'd like to bring. I also have with me 40 copies of a particularly uh, a, a slave auction, a story about a slave auction. If you'd like to take this with you and read it and write on it more this coming week, that's available to you. I've also put this online in the chat. There's the, four, the presentation by Sally Green. If you're new to the parish, never heard of that presentation, you might want to pick that up. And then just also, if you're new, we have Cronenberg's History of the Parish as well. And then if there's one more handout, sorry, the Hidden Wound, chapters 5, 6, and 7 for the coming week. Many of you have the book. If you haven't paid me for the book, when it's, when it's convenient, please do so. Are there still some up there? There are no books more left. But you can, you can pick up a, you can pick up a, if you'd like. There is one left. I'll talk to both of you. Okay. Very good. Um, so let's stop and just have a prayer at the end. I want you just to offer up anything, any residual discomfort or unhappiness that might be with you and to offer it up to a God who can and does care for you and all of us in this and let God carry us. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. God, you, you know the suffering that we have all endured in different ways. You chose to be one with us in Jesus and to enter into all the difficult and the pain and the, the anguish of our history. You've chose to love us right there, right there. And that is the meaning of your cross. We ask you to hold and redeem and to care for all the humanity in our parish life to hold and redeem and care for each of us here today and to keep us strong and trusting and open in this process with you and with one another in Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. God bless you.